All right, number five. How about special music and choir? Catholic Catechism number 1156. The musical tradition of the Universal Church is a treasure of inestimable value greater even than that of any other art. The main reason for this preeminence is that as a com com excuse me, combination of sacred music and words, it forms a necessary or integral part of solemn liturgy. The composition and singing of inspired psalms, often accompanied by musical instruments, were already closely linked to the liturgical celebrations of the Old Covenant. The Church continues and develops this tradition. Address one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with all your heart. Okay, Catholic rendering of the verse there. I think it's in Ephesians. Um, but it says here, He who sings prays twice. All right. And again, you're going to see a lot of this stuff is very similar to what goes on in independent fundamental Baptist church buildings. Okay. Um, now this is ministrymuse.com cantor. Talking about the cantor, the role of the cantor. Again, I have the link here in the PDF. It says here, quote, embodying the parish vision statement. One of the most important responsibilities of directors of music is the shaping and shepherding of all those involved in the musical life of the parish, professionals, volunteers, and choirs to view themselves as a true, as true ministers of service to the community gathered at prayer. Since the reforms of Vatican II, the role of cantor has become as important in Catholic liturgy as its counterpart has been for nearly three millennia in the Jewish tradition. The cantor is the catalytic link between the latent power and prayer of the music and the receptivity of the assembly to be moved by that power to an authentic response. The cantor, through his or her genuine prayerfulness and engaging manner, is the link between what the musicians are offering as a foundation for structured prayer and what the assembly contributes to the building of the liturgy. The song service, brother, makes the service. Mm -hmm. It is essential that everything about the cantor speaks engagement. The way he or she approaches the place from which they minister, the way they gesture the participation of the people in the pews, the way they authentically pray the music, all this works to either encourage or discourage the participation of the assembly. Hmm. Oh boy, I'll tell you what, a good choir director really takes the service in the right direction. Did you ever hear that? I have. Through knowledge of the music, so that there can be constant eye contact with the assembly, is critical. As cantors, we are leading the prayer, not reading it. Hmm. And we cannot engage the spirits of the people in the pews if we are glued to the music and focusing on that instead of communicating with the people. We cantors are communicating with the assembly, singing our prayer with the intent of eliciting the prayer of the people to whom we are ministering. In a deep sense, we cantors are feeding people, and as we would want with any meal that is a nourishing experience on all levels, our cheerfulness, our comfort with the music, our ease with our leadership, our welcome to the assembly, our vulnerability, and our strength, in short, our full humanity must be a part of what we offer the people who come to be fed. This is a task of great responsibility and not to be taken lightly. The best food in the world can become unpalatable if presented nervously, arrogantly, inauthentically, with uncertainty, unconfidently, impersonally, or without general, genuine love. Our challenge as cantors is to make sure that the nourishment of music and scripture so powerfully available in liturgy truly reaches the hearts and souls that came to be fed each, or that come to be fed each Sunday. Okay? Am I saying that song leaders are going to hell? No. But this position is not in the Bible for a Christian. Show it to me. And how many times have you heard somebody stand up in the, one of these IFB church buildings and they sing this beautiful song and everybody's just, oh, you know. And I've heard, I've heard, you know, independent fundamental Baptists applaud and shout and hoot and holler like they're at a football game because somebody sang a nice song. I was at one the one time the pastor's wife is screaming, touchdown, touchdown, touchdown. What? Excuse me? Oh, brother. Oh, that song. It was, oh, it was so wonderful. We follow the Bible in all matters of faith and practice? Huh. I don't remember that being done in the New Testament. I don't remember Paul standing up and singing How Great Thou Art and it brought everybody to tears. Or singing some other song, you know. I know How Great Thou Art wasn't written back then. You know, you know whatever. You know. But where's the stuff at? 
in the Catholic Church. Number six, how about tithing as a requirement? Every IFB church building I've ever been to has preached that. I have a message on giving, and they say, if you're not giving your 10% tithe, you're backslidden, you're out of God's will. Does that mean all IFB church buildings preach that? No. But most do. Again, my experience with talking to hundreds of people from all over the world, most of them have told me that, yeah, the IFB church building in my local area here, I went there for a while, and I was told I was not given 10%, and I was in trouble with the Lord as a result. Yeah. Catholic Catechism number 2043, 2043 here, it says, The fifth precept, you shall help to provide for the needs of the church, means that the faithful are obliged to assist with the material needs of the church, each according to his own ability. The faithful also have the duty of providing for the material needs of the church, each according to his own abilities. Baltimore Catechism number 297 says, What is meant by the commandment to contribute to the support of the church? By the commandment to contribute to the support of the church is meant that each of us is obliged to bear his fair share of the financial burden of the Holy See, of the diocese, and of the parish. Okay? It's right there. You're obliged. And you see what these guys do is they go out and they get themselves some big multi-million dollar building that they shouldn't have anyhow, and now they have a, mor a mortgage, which is, you know, French, in French there is, means death pledge, and they get this death pledge, I mean mortgage, and they get themselves in debt, and now they're saying, we got bills to pay. Hey, if you don't pay these bills, we're not going to have heat in here this winter. We're, we got to keep these lights on. We got bills to pay. We got all this stuff to pay, and it's your responsibility to pay for it. And you got to pay a big fat salary to the big fat hireling that's up behind the pulpit. A lot of times. Mm -hmm. You say, well, there are some that don't abuse that power, Brian. Some of them are, are paid off and all this other stuff. Yeah, but a lot aren't. And for those that are paid off, they're still milking the people for 10%, at least. But I want to show you here, Stephen Anderson, Independent Fundamental Baptist preaching, you know, you see that all the time. And of course, I don't even believe the guy's saved. You know, he hates the Jews and stuff. And I mean, that right there just, that disqualifies him. You know, you start hating on God's chosen people. Uh, yeah, no, <laughs> I don't think so. But this guy, you know, again, I'm going to use him. And people are going to say, well, my pastor's not the same as Stephen Anderson. Well, I hope not. But what he is saying here embodies what I've heard from independent fundamental Baptist pastors. It's the same thing that they preach. So I'm going to play this little clip here. And um, at 37 minutes and 12 seconds, he says, quote, the reason that I preach about it is because it's a commandment. I'm talking about the tithe. He has a whole sermon on the tithe. And so if I don't preach about it, and then you don't do it, uh, well, then you're the one violating the commandment. And you're the one that's going to be punished by God for not obeying this. Okay? So let's watch this. That's not the point. The reason that I preach about it is because it's a commandment. Yeah. Amen. And so if I don't preach about it, and then you don't do it, well then you're the one violating the commandment. Right. And yeah. you're the one that's going to be punished by God for not obeying this. And then I have it on my head that I didn't even preach about it. I didn't even tell you about it. You know, I mean, if I were you, I would want somebody to expose me to this so that I wouldn't be sinning and not even know that I'm sinning because I never even heard of it. I don't even know what tithing is, or I don't even know what that means. It is a biblical concept. You see, uh, the Bible says, and, and, and it's funny because some people will say this. They'll say, well, the Bible says, you know, people should give willingly, not by constraint. For God loves a cheerful giver. But here's the thing. What that's saying is that we shouldn't force people to give. Okay. Then at 37 verse 43, if you, as you heard him say there, he changes the King James Version text, which he does a lot. And he says, quote, you see, uh, the Bible says, and it's funny because some people will say this. They'll say, well, the Bible says, you know, people should give willingly, not by constraint. For God loves a cheerful giver. But here's the thing. What that's saying is that we shouldn't force people to give. But wait a second. Just a few seconds earlier, he was saying it's a commandment of God. It's a commandment of God, but it's not forced. 
Huh? That little novice doesn't know his Bible. What does that text actually say, by the way? 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 and 7 says, But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity. It doesn't say, not by constraint. He lied about the text. For God loveth the cheerful giver. See, Stephen Anderson had to change the text to cover up for the fact that he was teaching false doctrine. You see, that those three words right there, or of necessity, that just proves his whole statement that it's a commandment of God. A commandment is something that is a necessity. When you say it's not of necessity, you know, or of necessity there, when you say that, then it can't be a commandment of God. See? But continuing here, number seven, how about altar calls? Did you ever hear this? Come forward to an old-fashioned altar and confess your sins before Jesus Christ. Chapter and verse. Where's this stuff at? Catholic Catechism number 1182. The altar of the New Covenant uh, is the Lord's cross from which the sacraments of the Paschal Mystery flow. On the altar which is, in the, which is the center of the church, the sacrifice of the cross is made present under sacramental sacramental signs, the altar is also the table of the Lord to which the people of God are invited. In certain Eastern liturgies, the altar is also the symbol of the tomb. Christ truly died and is truly risen. Okay, you say, what's the altar? Well, here we have a picture of Williams Catholic Chapel, Williamstown, um, I guess that's Massachusetts there. Okay, you see it? Now let me show you one right beside it here. First Baptist Church of Nevada City, California. Hmm. Now I want you to notice that those two altars are not the same. Okay, the one's a Catholic altar, the other's a Baptist altar. They're not the same. See, because the Catholics say, "Do this in remembrance of me," the Baptists say, "This do in remembrance of me." See, so it's totally different. To not even related. I mean, it's just totally different. Yeah. Right. Okay. How about New Hope Baptist Church, St. Mary's, Georgia? Thought that was interesting. St. Mary's, you know. That one just says, in remembrance, up front there. But I think most of us can say that we've been to an independent fundamental Baptist church someplace, and they got that altar right up front there. You say that all, all the independent fundamental Baptists that have an altar in the front of their congregation, they're all going to hell, right? I didn't say that. I didn't say that at all. A lot of the brethren are trying to say that I'm, I'm trying to attack the Baptists and put them down and all this other stuff. Listen, let me explain it again. The problem here is not, is this stuff completely evil or satanic? That's not the main issue. The main issue is you're not getting it from the King James Bible. So quit pretending that you are. That's the issue. This stuff, it said there, that guy at the very beginning, Dr. Vernon C. Lyons said that Baptists reject all human religious traditions that have arisen since the time of the apostles. Well, then you better reject a lot of your practices that you're doing, which is exactly what I've done. Okay, so it's very interesting. By Dr. Vernon C. Lyons' qualifications for what makes a true Baptist, I am a true Baptist. I believe in baptizing adults, consenting adults that have been born again, and I believe in rejecting all human religious traditions that have arisen since the time of the apostles. So that makes me a true Baptist. It makes all you out there that worship in the buildings and hold on to these traditions and try to defend them without providing scripture, that makes you not Baptists, according to that guy's standards. Number eight, how about social events? Catholic Catechism number 1908. Second, the common good requires the social well-being and development of the group itself. Did you ever hear that? This is your church family. This is even more important than your regular family, than your life, than, than anything. The most important thing in this world is your church family. Did you ever hear that? Development is the epitome of all social duties. Certainly it is the particular function of authority to arbitrate in the name of the common good between various particular interests, but it should make accessible to each what is needed to lead a truly human life, food, clothing, health, work, education, and culture, suitable information, the right to establish a family, and so on. 
Okay, Catholic Catechism number 1912. The common good is always oriented toward the progress of persons. The order of things must be subordinate to the order of persons and not the other way around. This order is founded on truth, built up in justice, and animated by love. You know, all you need is love. You know, uh -huh. Catholic Catechism number 1913. Participation is the voluntary and generous engagement of a person in social interchange. It is necessary that all participate. I thought it was voluntary. Each according to his position and role in promoting the common good. Isn't that wonderful? This obligation, obligation, voluntary obligation, uh, we would call that an oxymoron. doesn't work. This obligation is inherent in the dignity of the human person. It's from the Catholic Catechism there. Now, many IFB groups conduct couples dinners, picnics, skits, and other social events. And if you don't attend that, you are labeled as not being a team player. You're labeled as putting things before your church family. Yeah, I've had it put on me. I'm not faithful, say, to the church. Like somehow I become disconnected from the church when I leave the building. While I'm in the stupid building, I'm part of the church. When I'm not in the stupid building, idiotic building, uh, ignorant, ridiculous building, then I'm not part of the church. That's ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. But now I'm going to read you a couple quotations here to further illustrate my point. Another guy who's a, who's a uh, Catholic, if there ever was one, this guy. This ridiculous nonsense right here. There you go. How about this satanic nonsense? You know. Here we have page 11. I haven't typed out here for sake of time. It'll be quicker to do it this way. Page 11. Quote, Real spiritual growth is never an isolated individualistic pursuit. Maturity is produced through relationships and community. You watch out for that word community. But uh, you see that thing a lot of times with the independent fundamental Baptists. You shouldn't be isolated. Don't be a hermit now. Page 130. We are created for community, fashioned for fellowship, fellowship, you know, and formed for family, and none of us can fulfill God's purposes by ourselves. You mean like Paul that uh, didn't see any of the brethren for three years? Hmm. And there was another time there was 15 years? But I guess Paul was a backslidden state that whole time, right? Sure he was. Page 131. Disconnected and cut off from the lifeblood of a local body, your spiritual life will wither and eventually cease to exist. Huh? So in other words, if you don't, aren't part of a local church, then your spiritual life will wither and cease to exist? You mean you lose your salvation? You know? See, this is nonsense. This is, what is this? This is Catholic. All right? Number 132, page 132 here. The person who says, I don't need the church, is either arrogant or ignorant. How about that? Sure. Page 133. Many believe one can be a good Christian without joining or even attending a local church. But God would strongly disagree. Really? God would disagree with you not joining a local church? That's interesting because the term local church does not appear in the King James Bible. Huh. So God, if God disagrees, then he'd be contradicting his own word. Yeah. And you say, but Brian, Rick Warren's not an independent fundamental Baptist pastor. I know, but a lot of you independent fundamental Baptists out there have the same philosophies as Rick Warren when it comes to your church building. Mm -hmm. You don't think I'm legitimate, a lot of you, because I don't go to a church building. And I have no intention of ever going to a church building. Page 133, you are not the body of Christ on your own. You need others to express that together, not separated. We are his body. Uh, nonsense. Again, what do you do with a believer in Pakistan? Some guy gets online and gets saved. He goes out and he says, I'm a member of the body of Christ. You know, he's dead. You know, he might have to fellowship, you know, or worship the Lord on his own for a while. Number one, or page 134, 
he says here, quote, isolation breeds deceitfulness. Tell that to the Apostle Paul. Page 136, Satan loves detached believers, unplugged from the life of the body, isolated from God's family, and unaccountable to spiritual leaders. Hello, man of God, tell me what to do, right? Mm -hmm. You and your infallible papal decrees. Because he knows they are defenseless and powerless against his tactics. Sure. So uh, somebody who's detached, who's sick and tired of all the apostate Baptists and Catholics and Presbyterians and whoever in their area, and they say there's nobody here that believes the King James Bible, so I'm not going to be part of that. Then they're easy prey for the devil. Uh, no, quite the opposite is true. The people that stay in these apostate church buildings, they're the ones that are easy prey for the devil. So ridiculous. Page 143, you were created for community. Sure. Page 151, it means giving up our self-centeredness and independence in order to become inter interdependent. Check out the New Age philosophy with that one. Yeah, totally New Age. Just ridiculous. Page 176, you cannot grow to Christ-likeness alone. Want to bet? Did Paul... And, you know, I know you should go out, you should witness to people, you should, you should, you know, try to fellowship with the brethren if you can. I understand that. I'm not saying that you should go live in a, in a hole in the ground someplace, okay? No, you have a ministry of, rec ministry of reconciliation. I understand that. But to force people to say, if you're not part of a local church, you're out of fellowship with God. You're some kind of rebel or something. That's nonsense. Absolute nonsense. Page 176. Remember, it's all about love, loving God and loving others. Oh, doesn't that just make you feel warm and fuzzy all over? Yeah. So, you know, you say, what should you do with a book like that? Well, you know, pretty much like that. And you say, Brian, that was wrong. You shouldn't have done that. That was very, you know, arrogant and ignorant and everything else. That guy... That book that I just threw there is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. That guy is going to send millions of people to hell. That guy has messed up church building, churches group, church groups. He's messed up people right and left. The man is a minister of Satan. I'd throw him like that if I could. All right. That guy is a wicked man. And Christians, let me, let me just speak to something real quick here before I continue. The Laodicean church age is marked by people who are neither hot nor cold. They're lukewarm. It's time that we start to call out sin for what it is. It's time that we start to hate evil and love good. And I get real sick and tired of the brethren. Oh, I wouldn't take such a strong stand. I, I just wouldn't do that. That's offensive. You better offend people. You better take some strong stands. You better say, that Rick Warren book is a wicked piece of trash. It's not worthy to be toilet paper. If you're offended at me throwing Rick Warren's book, let me tell you, you got some problems. Kind of, you know, funny too, you know, this whole thing of Rick Warren, you know, saying all this stuff, you know, you can't grow to Christ likeness alone. If you're not part of a local church, you're out of fellowship and blah, 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 blah you know, whatever. Kind of reminds me of what George W. Bush said. Little clip here. Either you are with us. Or you are with the terrorists. You know, yeah. Either you're with us or you're with the terrorists. Sure. Of course, there's a link to that video. But, uh, number nine. How about excommunication and shunning? A lot of you are probably thinking about doing that right now if you've made it this far. Catholic Catechism number 1445 says, The words bind and loose men, whomever you exclude from your communion will be excluded from communion with God. Whomever you receive anew into your communion, God will welcome back into His. Reconciliation with the church is inseparable from reconciliation with God. Did you ever get that? I have. I've had some of the brethren say, you left our church, so you're excommunicated. We shun you. People that I thought were my friends have turned against me numerous times because I left their church building. What is that? Catholic? That's not in here. We'll see about that in a minute. But what if the church is wrong? Catholic Catechism number 1463. 
Certain particular grave sins incur excommunication, the most severe ecclesiastical penalty which impedes the reception of the sacraments and the exercise of certain ecclesiastical acts, and for which absolution consequently cannot be granted according to canon law except by the Pope. Gee, that sounds familiar. You're excommunicated and it can't be uh, reversed except by the pastor, the man of God, you know, the Pope. Okay, we'll go on to the next one. Baltimore Catechism one, number 169C. How does a baptized person separate himself from full incorporation in the mystical body by heresy? Incorporation, too, that's interesting, being that most, a lot of the IFB churches are incorporated. 501c3. It says here, a baptized person separates himself from full incorporation in the mystical body by heresy when he openly rejects or doubts some doctrine proposed by the Catholic Church as a truth of divine Catholic faith, though still professing himself a Christian. So in other words, if you say, I don't agree with what's going on here, I'm still saved, but I don't agree with this, you are excommunicated from the Catholic Church, just like the independent fundamental Baptists do. Baltimore Catechism one, number 169E. When does a baptized person separate himself from full incorporation in the mystical body by schism? A baptized person separates himself from full incorporation in the mystical body by schism when he openly refuses obedience to the lawful authorities of the church, particularly to the Baptist pastor. Oh, I'm sorry. To the Pope, also known as a Baptist pastor many times. Remember what the guy said earlier? You better not speak against the man of God. You keep your hands off the man of God. If you don't, we're going to kick you out of here, you know, kind of deal. See? Baltimore Catechism number 206. Why does a Catholic sin against faith by taking part in non-Catholic worship? Remember non-Baptist worship? A Catholic sins against faith by taking part in non-Catholic worship when he intends to identify himself with a religion he knows is defective. And remember, Country Chapel Baptist Church that I showed the link to, their website, and their words, their rules and things like that, their standards, they say if you go to a non-Baptist church and you take up membership there, you are immediately out. You're done. You're finished. And I can tell you, I've been to these places. They excommunicate you. They shun you. Just like any cult would. And I'll say something here again. My wife over here, you know, she's sitting back there off, off the field of view, but she's sitting over here. And when we were going to this country chapel thing and things were starting to get bad, she said to me, she said, that place is a cult. And I try to have grace. I try to have grace for brethren and stuff like that. And I get kind of layered to seeing myself sometimes, you know. And I said, oh, come on. It's not a cult. You know, that's kind of rough. But you know what? After seeing the way we were treated, after seeing how some of the brethren have attacked us from there, it's a cult. When you have somebody who's wrong there or whatever, and somebody leaves the cult, and you see people in there, it's like that. Don't act, you know, they act like you don't even exist. You know, and they, they stab you in the back and everything. That's a cult. You say, what does the Bible say about it? 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 14 through 15 says, And if any obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. So is there a thing of saying, hey, brother, you got to leave for a while? Sure. Absolutely. Some brother is in sin. You kick him out of the fellowship. But look what happens here. Yet, count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. How can you admonish somebody if you're not talking to them? If you've excommunicated them, if you're shunning them, how can you admonish? Why do some Baptist churches, you know, excommunicate and shun the brethren simply because they left their fellowship there? And I've had that thing happen a couple times to me. You know, I've left these independent fundamental you know, funny mental Baptists, and I see them out in public someplace, and they act like I don't even exist. Why? Very cult-like. 
Okay, and this is interesting here too. Page nine, I'll show you the book here. Page nine of this book, the church teaches, look right there, by Jesuit fathers of St. Mary's College. Oh boy, Jesuits. You know, this thing here, page nine, says, quote, and at the same time I condemn, reject, and anathematize everything that is contrary to those pr propositions and all heresies without exception that have been condemned, rejected, and anathematized by the church. Okay? Condemn, reject, and anathematize. Yeah. Now finally, let's talk about the last point here. Number 10, integration of church and state military goals, republicanism. All right. Again, remember, I am a registered Republican, so don't get all excited and, oh, you're a liberal, liberal Democrat. No, I'm not. Okay. But I'm going to just make a couple points here about this whole thing. And, you know, I already stated, and I've talked about this thing for years now, this thing of 501c3 incorporation. Back in the 1960s, under Lyndon Baines Johnson, he was the one that devised this whole scheme of bringing church buildings under IRS control, thereby silencing the pastors. Okay? And I'm going to play a little video clip here, and this is not in the PDF, but it's very important to show this thing. This is a, a fairly recent video clip because it's talking about Obama and some of the churches down there with the black churches and how they are told by the IRS and the federal government what they can and cannot say in support of Obama. And this shows you 501c3 churches are controlled. So check this clip out. How does President Obama get to 270 electoral votes? Well, his clearly strongest voter group is African Americans, and hundreds of preachers and other religious leaders are going to get a pep talk of sorts from members of the Congressional Black Caucus on how to combat the recent rise in voter ID laws. I'm joined now by the chairman of the Congressional Black Caucus, Congressman Emanuel Cleaver, Democrat from Missouri, who is also an ordained minister. Congressman, it's good to see you. Good morning. Good to be with you. So you've got this big summit tomorrow. Essentially, what is your message to several hundred clergy members, I understand, who will be there? Yes, we'll have uh, representatives from nine denominations who actually pastor somewhere in the neighborhood uh, of about uh, 10 million people. And uh, we're going to, first of all, uh, equip them with the information they need to know uh, about what they can say and what they cannot say uh, in the church uh, that would violate their 501c3 status with the IRS. In fact, we're going to have the IRS administrator there. We're going to have the Attorney General Eric Holder there. Uh, we're going to have the lawyers uh, organization from around the country, the ACLU, all giving ministers guidance on what they can and cannot do. Isn't that incredible? I mean, isn't that thing incredible? You say, what is that? That is a government-run church. And most church buildings here in this country, including the Independent Fundamental Baptists, most of them are 501c3. You say, name a couple. Okay. Liberty Baptist Church that I used to attend. James Melton, and he defends the thing. He says you're anti-government if you're against 501c3. <laughs> okay. Uh, I thought that the Congress was not supposed to make any law regarding the establishment of religion or the free exercise thereof. I thought that was the First Amendment. Well then, by being 501c3, you are the one who's actually anti-government. You're going against the Constitution. But James Melton is. Dr. Peter Ruckman, their church is 501c3. And a whole bunch more. I'm not going to get into all of them there. But, you know, hey, if you're going to an independent fundamental Baptist church, why don't you ask your pastor? Ask him if he's 501c3. When election time rolls around and you hear him stand up there at the pulpit and he says, I can't tell you who to vote for. Ask him why. Ask him to provide you with a chapter and verse on that one. Say, oh, Pastor, I heard you say that you're not allowed to talk about who to vote for. Could you show me that scripture in here? Show it to me. If you're out there and you're a Baptist pastor, how about you show me a verse in here that says I'm not allowed to talk about who to vote for. See? You see, the Catholic Church is yoked up with the government. We're going to talk about that as we continue here. 
Here we have page 74. I'm gonna put this screenshot up there because I want you to actually see this. This is very, very, very significant. Of this book right here, the church teaches by the Jesuits, okay? I want you to see this thing. This is very important to get. Okay, it says here, quote, number 154 there, it says, we are taught by the words of the gospel that in this church and under its control, there are two swords, the spiritual and the temporal. Both of these, that is the spiritual and the temporal swords are under the control of the church. The first is wielded by the church. The second is wielded on behalf of the church. Huh. The temporal sword going out and starting wars and fighting and killing and police actions and stuff like that. Military wars. It's done on behalf of the church. Huh. Continuing here. The first is wielded by the hand of the priest. The spiritual, you know. They're trying to say this here. Which of course the Catholics aren't really Bible believers so it's not true. But look at this. Look at the part here in, in the highlighted. The second, by the hand of kings and soldiers, but at the wish and by the permission of the priests. Okay? Sword must be sword subordinated to sword, and it is only fitting that the temporal authority should be subject to the spiritual. Now, you might not realize how significant this is. Okay, you might just be sitting there going, what's the big deal? This thing is written by Jesuits. Okay, study the Jesuit order. These are the people who are running everything. Okay, you say, I thought it's the Illuminati. Adam Wieshaupt, there in Bavaria, he was a Jesuit. Okay, it's the Jesuit order that's running things. And you say, how's that line up with the Bible? Revelation chapter 17, verse 18 says, And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Huh. So then you mean that the Roman Catholic Church actually rules all the governments out there? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. You say, prove that, Brian. Okay. Watch the news. Watch our president, our presidents, go over there to the Vatican and bow down and kiss his ring. Watch it. The Vatican is not a church. It's a political power. The most powerful form of politics on the planet. And if the Vatican decides that a man is going to not get into office or the man is going to be assassinated, he's assassinated. If you think that the Vatican is this powerless, just little religious system over there, you are quite deceived. Okay? And you say, but what does this have to do with independent fundamental Baptist churches, Brian? Well, many of them support the phony war on terror. Show me that where there's an end times war on terror in the Bible. There's wars of terror, you know. Jesus talks about be not troubled for these things must come to pass. You know, there will be fear, men's hearts failing them for fear. Okay, wars of terror, but there's no war on terror. All right. We're going to defeat terrorism. We're going to make everything safe for everybody. All you got to do is just give up all your rights. <laughs> yeah, sure. Many IFB pastors support, supported Skull and Bonesman George W. Bush. Here you get this guy who says in his autobiography, he comes out and he says about his senior year in, in Yale, he joins Skull and Bones. He said, I joined Skull and Bones, a secret society so secret I can't say anything more. He openly admits to being a member of Skull and Bones. People have seen him and his father both out at the Bohemian Grove worshiping this big giant stone owl, committing human sacrifices to it. You know, I'm sorry if a lot of this stuff is scaring you. I'm sorry if it's, if it's out of the reality that you want to believe in, but it's there. It's absolutely the, there. These guys are Masonic. These guys are high level Satanists. Oh, but bless God, he's a fundamental Christian. You know, and I was in independent fundamental Baptist churches at the time when George W. Bush was running things, when he was a president. Well, he wasn't running things. He's just a puppet figurehead. But I was there, and I had these IFB pastors standing up in the pulpit saying, I bless God. I thank God that we have a Bible-believing president. You have no more spiritual discernment than that? But, of course, now everything's bad because we got Obama, you know. And a lot of these independent fundamental Baptist pastors were voting for Romney in the last election. Romney's a Mormon. 
Well, he's the lesser of two evils. <laughs> yeah, sure. Oh, yeah. Tell the Lord about that one. You know. Many preached that Ronald Reagan was great while ignoring his criminal connections. Ronald Reagan was setting up terrorists. Ronald Reagan was covering up things. Ronald Reagan was involved in scheme after scam and things, all these bad things. I'm not even going to get into all of it, but one of the biggest ones, Republican, Republican Congressman John W. DeCamp. Look at the Franklin cover-up sometime. The Roman Catholics out in uh, Omaha, Nebraska, they were out there and they had this big, huge orphanage for boys, Boys Town, America. And these boys were being shipped in to the White House during the Reagan and Bush administration for sex orgies. Little boys. And some of these boys, two of them, got older. Paul Bonacci, and I can't think of the other guy's name, he actually went and perjured himself. And they, uh, Paul Bonacci, Troy Bonner, I think was the other guy. And then there was Alicia Owens, a young girl that was at this orphanage. And they described being taken to the White House and being molested in the Reagan and Bush administration. And how many IFB pastors got all righteous and indignation and everything else when Bill Clinton was fornicating with Monica Lewinsky, but Reagan and Bush have young boys being brought in for sex parties, and it's like, I don't see anything. What, what do you mean? Skull and bones? I don't see anything like that. You know, I, I, don't, I don't see it. I don't know what you're talking about. Hypocrisy. Total stinking hypocrisy. And these aren't the claims of liberal Democrats. Like I said, it's John DeCamp. Guy was a Vietnam War veteran, you know, and a Republican congressman. And he talks about how the Republicans were getting in trouble all the time for bringing young boys in to have sex with them. A whole huge thing. And by the way, another interesting thing, there was a whole documentary that was done on this thing. I think it was some um, British film company had come over and filmed a whole thing on this. And, you know, the Franklin Scandal, I think it was called, it was going to be aired on national TV. And a company that George Bush Sr. Uh, had stock in pulled this thing from off the television networks. Very interesting. Many Baptist pastors also continue to say, God bless America, and then they turn right around and talk about how wicked America is. And there's a video. I'm not going to show any video clips of it, but it's Dr. Sam Gipp, and I think very highly of Dr. Gipp. He's done a lot for the King James Bible. I've met him in person. He's a good man. I don't doubt Dr. Gipp's salvation. Not one bit. He's a good man. But the guy is just totally hypocritical when it comes to politics. You know? And he has this whole sermon... I'm still proud to be an American. Pride is sin. You know, America is still the greatest country. I don't agree with that. America has become wicked. And again, why are a lot of these Baptist pastors covering up that fact? Is it because it could affect their uh, salary? Or perhaps their pension? Or perhaps their retirement? Or perhaps it's because they're in a 501c3 building and they're scared to death to say anything against the government because they know that the government owns their building and owns them too. But don't you worry, because when things get really bad, your independent fundamental Baptist pastor is going to stand up and fight for you. Don't you worry. He won't fight right now when it would be easy to fight, but he'll do it when, the, when the, you know, everything gets real bad. Don't worry. He'll defend you. Don't worry. Don't worry. Don't stick to the Bible. Stick to your traditions. Stay in your building. And your pastor will defend you when things get bad. When the sodomites are pounding down the door, when the sodomites are coming into the congregation and saying, you will do this and you will do that, don't you worry. Your pastor is going to stand up at that point. He may not do it right now, but he'll stand up when, it get, when things get bad. Keep telling yourself that. And many Baptists also cheer on Roman Catholics like Bill O'Reilly and Sean Hannity because they're on Fox News. You know, conservative Fox News. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Right.
None of the stuff was practiced in the New Testament, brethren. Where do you see Paul talking about the Roman government? All this stuff is ridiculous. So what is the conclusion of this matter? All right. What's the conclusion here? What have we learned, uh, if you stuck with me this far? Number one, it is a fact that many independent fundamental Baptist, Baptist practices come from Catholicism and not from the King James Bible. It's a fact. I've shown it to you. You can't tell me I don't know what I'm talking about. I've given you the quotes. I have the PDF here. You can go download the thing. You can look them up yourself. You can go to the Catholic uh, website there where the catechism is. You can read the catechism for yourself. And you can compare it to the King James Bible and you can see it's not in here, but it's in there. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 15 and 16. Better get a hold of this. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. Hmm. Who is the mother of harlots in the Bible? Mystery Babylon. The mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Revelation chapter 17. And who is Mystery Babylon identified as? The Roman Catholic Church. Did you know that the Roman Catholic Church has some daughters? You see, a lot of times you have a whorehouse in the modern vernacular. And you have a woman, an older woman. And she's kind of the uh, madam, you know, there or whatever. And she has her women that work under her, her harlots, and she puts them with certain people and she kind of oversees the whole thing. Kind of like a pimp would, a prostitute, but she's a madam, you know, of the whorehouse. That's very similar to what Mystery Babylon is. You see, Mystery Babylon is the mother of harlots. It doesn't say that she is the greatest harlot, which she is, but she is, you know, she has harlots under her control. She's a mother, she has daughters. Shall we, as Christians, go to the mother of harlots and seek to become one of her daughters? No, because then you're joined to her. Then you, you see, God looks down and he says, look at all these traditions you got yourself into. You're doing all these things that are wicked, that are contrary to my word. It's bad news. Now let me make a couple points here. Many of the practices in this study are not evil, but Baptists need to be honest and admit where they come from. Okay, some guy standing up in the middle of the, at the beginning of the service and reading a portion of scripture, that's not evil, but it's not scriptural, see? And it comes from the Catholic Church. Better get a hold of that thing. The reason I did these two studies was simply to make my brethren think and examine their beliefs and practices in the light of scripture. And that's the truth. Okay, thirdly, you may need to abandon your IFB church very soon with the coming sodomite persecution. And I've been talking about this all through the study. It's coming. It's coming soon. Very, very, very soon. Obama said that he's not going to do it, which in Obama speak means that he is going to do it. Okay, two portions of scripture to read here and then we're done. John 4 verse 23 and 24 says, But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Truth. Are you worshiping Jesus Christ in spirit and in truth? Are your beliefs, are your practices lining up here? Or do they line up over there with the catechism? Philippians chapter 4 verses 8 and 9 says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, Paul in other words, do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Let me just give you a little bit of advice, okay, out there. If you're an independent fundamental Baptist and you're saying, Brian, I'm just not going to give up this thing. I believe in what we're doing. I think it's really a good system. I, whatever. If you're doing that, let me just say this. The time to prepare for trouble is not when the trouble arrives. Okay? 
you need to prepare beforehand. Now you can see, if you have any spiritual discernment at all, you can see that the sodomite thing is getting bad. Okay, the atheists are getting bad. The Catholics are getting bad. The Muslims are getting bad. I'm going to be doing a sermon on this in the future. You know, the biggest threats to, to Bible-believing Christians. You can see that stor those storm clouds are on the horizon. All right? Then you wait till it gets there. You wait till they're banging on your door, trying to pass legislation. Then you go underground. Then you go to the house church. No. You prepare for it now. And if you're not willing to give up your church building and all the traditions and that thing, you're going to have a real rough time when, that, when the axe falls, so to speak. The best thing that you can do is you don't want to give it up? Okay, well, then at least practice. At least start to look at how to do a house church. And by the way, you don't go to people and ask permission for it, okay? You don't need men's permission to worship the Lord right, or to do the work of the Lord. But you got to get that thing in your mind. you got to start getting that thing fixed up here. I may need to depart from this system. And i got to get myself ready for that time. All right? You're going to have to learn to do things outside of your church building and not be tied to that system. And if you're in a system where you have this independent fundamental Baptist pastor and he is lording over you, and he is telling you that if you're not in there every time the doors are open, and he says you're not faithful, if you're not coming in and all this other stuff, if you're in a system like that, you better run away from that thing. Run from it. Flee it. All right? So that's going to be it. Um, thank you very much for watching. Uh, that's going to be it for this study. Got a lot more other studies coming up, so that's going to be it. Thank you very much for watching. Stick to the book.